Uh, thank you very much, Paul, for this very kind introduction. Uh, needless to say, it's an honor to be here, and I'm truly delighted to have an opportunity to talk about the effects of globalizations on inequality. Uh, this is a topic that has been of great interest to me as an academic before joining the World Bank. It's clearly of great interest to the World Bank, uh, but it's also of great interest to everyone, uh, both in advanced economies and in developing countries these days. Uh, so I don't need to spend much time motivating the subject. I'll, I'll, I'll get straight to it, um, especially given that I only have one hour to talk and I have a lot of ground to cover. Um, so uh, let me start by giving you a very brief roadmap of what I will try to talk about. I will start by briefly describing the phase of globalization. Uh, we speak of our time as being the age of globalization. Um, so I will describe its main features and the drivers of it. And then I will also describe what has happened in the last few years. I will uh, make the point that we are experiencing a global backlash against globalization. Uh, then I'll spend a good deal of time talking about the causes for this retreat. And I will focus on two main ones. The, the first one is the perception uh, in many advanced countries that competition and trade have become unfair. And the second one is the increase in inequality within countries. Um, and uh, while doing this, I will talk, I will hint at various policy implications. I will come back to policy implications. Time for meeting at the very end of the talk. Okay, so um, what, what are the defining features of this age of globalization? So first of all, all measurable trade barriers have come uh, dramatically down. And uh, you can see here the word measurable is underlined. What I have in mind here is primarily tariffs. Uh, tariffs are very low these days, but there are also many other trade barriers, and I will come back to this point later, that we have a very hard time measuring, and it's not clear that they have come down as much. Um, in addition, trade volumes have exploded uh, after uh, the end of World War II, and many developing countries uh, including China, India, Southeast Asia, countries in Southeast Asia, Latin America, are now integrated in the world trading system. So uh, uh, visually, uh, what you see in this figure is the um, uh, evolution of, of exports, global exports, as share of global GDP. And uh, you can see that um, up until uh, World War II, uh, this, this share was fairly constant. Then, after the end of the war, the share starts increasing. Uh, we reach the 90s here. This share starts increasing very rapidly. This is what people refer to as the age of hyperglobalization, fueled by global value chains. Then the global financial crisis hits around 2007, 2008. Then trade declines. Then it bounces back up, but then it never really attains its previous level. Uh, of course, we have very few years in this part, and I will come back again to that. But for now, we're going to focus on this trend, on the very fast rise of international trade post-World War II. This was a global trend. Uh, this was not driven by a few countries. We, we saw this trend in the entire world. Uh, you can see this uh, evolution for different countries, including the United States, India, China, the UK. Uh, two things stand out that I want to point out. The first one is the red line. The red line represents China. So not surprisingly, during the 90s, as we all know, you, you see a huge increase in the share of exports in the Chinese economy. However, it's not China alone that drives this global increase in international trade. Uh, the other interesting case in this graph is the case of the UK. This is the light blue line. And what's interesting about the UK is that in contrast to other countries, we don't see this uh, uh, dramatic rise in exports in the UK as share of GDP. You, the UK was already highly integrated. Uh, it was an open economy. During the interwar period, it experienced um, a, a decline in, in, in its exports. So that's when the empire 
turned inward. And then after World War II, um, it resumes the previous trend. So it's, it's essentially what's ha what happens here is we're coming back to the old level. Um, importantly, uh, developing countries uh, participate in this increase in global trade. Um, in this graph, the green part uh, represents the share of high-income countries in um, world exports. And as you would expect, the high-income countries uh, uh, command a, a large share of total exports. This is by virtue of their size. By the way, the classification of countries is based on the classification scheme of the World Bank as of 1987. So it's time invariant. I took here the classification of the countries as it was this year. Um, so China, for example, China was a low-income country at that time, so China is in these pink uh, bars. Uh, the other colors refer to lower middle and upper middle income countries, respectively. And uh, what's really striking in this graph is that if you take these three groups of countries together, so all countries other than high-income countries, Together, by 2015, they account for approximately 33% of uh, total world trade. And again, some people may say this is all driven by China, which is here, but it, it's not just China. Of course, China, by virtue of its size, accounts for a very large share of this trend, but other countries, India, for example, also participate. Uh, so developing countries, the importance of developing countries is rising. What are the drivers of this trade growth? So I want to make three points here that are going to be important for the messages uh, of this talk. The first one is that the world trade expansion that we observed during that time is due to policy as much as to the decline of transport and communication costs. Uh, second, uh, the claims of a secular slowdown of trade are premature. I showed you this dip in international trade after the financial crisis. I will come back to that point and I will argue that it's, it's a little early to argue that this is a reversal in trend. Uh, however, and that's my third point, the recent backlash uh, we experience against globalization may actually lead eventually to an uh, era of sustained deglobalization. So these are the three points I want to make next. So let me get to the first one, the role of, of trade policy. Uh, until very recently, there was a very strong belief, uh, both um, among acad academics, but also um, among pr practitioners, um, that trade policy was irrelevant for the growth of trade. And the reason for this view was that people believed that uh, transport and communication costs played a much more important role. So the general, the, 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 accept wisdom, the accepted wisdom um, on this question was that globalization was driven by, te by technology, by technological change, and therefore the globalization process was both inevitable and unstop unstoppable. Uh, no one could foresee a reversal of globalization. Um, I've made the point in previous work, so in a, in a, in a uh, chapter that uh, I wrote for the Handbook of Commercial Policy together with my long-term co-author Nina Pauchnik, that this view uh, was uh, misguided and partly due to the fact that it, it, it's quite hard to measure trade policy in the 21st century. We tend to focus our measurement on tariffs because these are easy to measure, but there are many different, there are many other measures that are perhaps more important, uh, nevertheless very hard to measure. Uh, where did this view come from, that trade policy was irrelevant, that trade barriers was, were irrelevant? So let me try to explain in, in a couple of graphs. So this is a graph showing the evolution of U.S. tariffs between 1875 and 2002, right? And uh, these tariffs uh, peaked here, these are the smooth holiday tariffs, and then after World War II, as I documented earlier, they started going down. This is the dramatic decline of tariffs. Then we reach this period of the 70s, 1970s, and then after the 1970s, they start they, they, they keep declining, but the decline is not as pronounced as before. So the big change in U.S. tariffs is between 
1947 and 1970. There is a, a paper that's very well known in academic circles by Kim Woo Yi in the Journal of Political Economy in 2003. And Kim Woo Yi made the following point. So he related the decline in tariffs in the United States starting in 1962. So here on the horizontal axis, you have 1962 until 1998. So he shows here the decline in tariffs and shows what I described to you before that basically we still have a, a decline in tariffs until 1970, but after that the decline is very small and we are talking about very small tariffs in the first place. What happens to exports on the other hand? So US exports uh, rise very rapidly during that time and world exports uh, rise as well, okay? This is the period of rapid globalization. So Kim Woo made the point, how could trade policy have a big effect when tariffs hardly changed during that time and they were very small to start with? Uh, it's, it, it's not plausible that tariffs had a big impact. Um, and so this was viewed widely as indirect evidence that trade policy did not play an important role in globalization, in the rise of exports. Um, of course, the story is much more nuanced. It turns out that, uh, you know, to, just to give you a preview of, of, of what uh, Kim Woo found, it, it turns out that tariffs did have an effect, but the effect was in, in interaction with technology, namely, thanks to technological change, production is now fragmented. Firms can split the production activity across many different uh, countries of the world. Parts and components cross borders multiple times. During that time, we saw the emergence of global value chains. So what this means is that if you have a tariff on, on a product, this tariff can, can have escalating effects as the product, as the parts and components cross borders multiple times. So yes, you can have very low tariffs. You can have very small changes in tariffs, but these changes can have, can have cumulative effects in an era where you have fragmented production. So eventually this is the point that he made, but nevertheless, initially this graph was viewed as evidence that trade policy plays a very small role. Uh, let me make the point that actually trade policy is important by introducing some more graphs. Uh, so on the left you see um, uh, uh, some measures of uh, uh, technological change, of ICT use. And these are the graphs that support the view that technological change played a very important role in promoting globalization. So some of these measures include the green line shows the number of individuals using the internet. Uh, the purple line, this is the steepest increase here, um, shows the mobile cell subscriptions for 100 persons. Uh, the blue line, fixed broad broadband uh, subscriptions, so these are all different measures of ICT use. All these measures go up very steeply uh, in the 90s. On the, however, if you look here on the right panel, what happens to transport and communication costs over the period 1920 to 2015, again, you see this very rapid decline in transport and communication costs between 1920 and 2020. And when you look at this graph, from afar, your first reaction is going to be, there were dramatic declines in transport and communication costs, and these are what fueled, uh, the, it's this, this, these declines that fueled the globalization wave. Now again, if you look more carefully, you'll see that most of the decline is between 1920 and 1970. And so here, some of the measures are an airfare, the airfare between New York and London, the round trip, uh, a telephone call uh, between New York and London, uh, the sea freight rates, um, uh, and, and so all these computers, so the storage uh, cost per megabyte, so all these measures uh, declined dramatically up to 1970, but then they remain fairly constant. However, the, 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 the period of rapid globalization happens here, happens during this era, and at that time we don't see a very a very rapid decline of transport and communication costs. So if you just look at these pictures and you just focus on correlations, there is little support of the view that it's uh, transport and communication costs exclusively that fuel this globalization wave. On the other hand, if you look at some broader policy measures, um, 
you can tell a different story. So um, in this graph, um, I've put some measures of trade policy between 1948 and 2016. So the green line shows applied tariffs for developed countries. So this is very similar to what I showed you before for the United States. And uh, two points that are important here are number one, these tariffs are relatively low, and number two, they don't decline very steeply. But look at what happens to the tariffs, to the applied tariffs for developing countries. So this is the, the orange line here. Uh, so these tariffs decline actually quite steeply. So while tariff reductions were not very pronounced for developed countries, they were quite pronounced for developing countries that had higher tariff rates to start with. More importantly, if you look at WTO membership, the World Trade Organization membership, so this membership increases over time um, uh, quite a lot, and it increases because many developing countries enter the World Trade Organization. Uh, last but not least, you see a dramatic increase in the number of regional trade agreements. So these are the blue bars here as of 2019. So to sum up, despite these claims that tariffs have been very low post 1960, 1970 in developed countries, we, see, we still see uh, sharp declines in tariffs in many developing countries. And one point I made earlier is that developing countries, one of the characteristics of, main characteristics of globalization is that we see developing countries participating. Uh, so applied tariffs for developing countries do increase, do decrease quite sharply. We do see increased membership in the World Trade Organization, and we see uh, a large increase in the number of regional trade agreements. These are trade policy measures, and they all coincide chronologically with a period of very rapid globalization, of hyper-globalization. So none of these facts by itself is proof that trade policy did play a role, but, but cumulatively they suggest a role for policy. Uh, there is a lot of work that has argued that one of the mechanisms through which World Trade Organization membership or regional trade agreements uh, fueled globalization, hyper-globalization actually, is by introducing rules in the system, by making trade predictable and stable. And this, on the other hand, uh, uh, induced firms to make long-run decisions that required large sunk costs. In order to invest in global value chains, in order to split your production uh, across many different countries, you need to have some certainty about the economic environment, looking into the future, and uh, the rules uh, inherent in uh, the World Trade Organization, in, in trade agreements, in regional trade agreements, provided this stability and this predictability. Okay, now uh, let me talk about um, the reversal, so the retreat that uh, we're experiencing in recent years. So first, uh, let me note that global trade has slowed down after the 2000 financial crisis. This, this is something that has has been noted by many, and uh, some people have, uh, 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 have put forward the hypothesis that this slowdown is a secular slowdown, and to a certain extent it reflects again a technological development, namely fragmentation, international fragmentation has run its course. If you have a product, if you have a car for example, you can split it into parts and components to a certain extent, but at some point you hit the limit. You can, you can no further split a car into, into smaller and smaller parts. So one hypothesis is that the reason we see a slowdown of trade is precisely because this technologically driven fragmentation has run its course. Uh, let me uh, look at this a little more closely. So this is the graph that goes along with this hypothesis and shows the slowdown uh, in more detail. So this graph shows you the fraction of what we call GVC trade. So this is trade uh, associated with global value chains. And uh, you know, how we measure that is actually quite involved. For now, I will ask you to take my word for it, that this is what this represents. So this global value chain trade, again, increased between 1970 and the financial crisis. During the financial crisis, it goes down, then it goes slightly up, and then it starts going down, and it never, 
it never bounces back to its previous level. So people look at this graph and they say this is evidence of a technological driven uh, slowdown. So I've made the point in previous work um, that actually it's, it's premature to, 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 to say that this is technologically driven uh, for two reasons. The first and obvious one is that we are talking about a very short period. We are talking about three, four years. So it's, it's, it's too early to be talking about a, a, a technologically driven uh, change in trend. Second, if you actually break down trade and you look more carefully at its components, um, there is a different story you can tell. So what we did in this graph is we took some measures of particular uh, subcomponents of trade. One is in red, parts and components. The other one is in a dotted line, intermediates, other than parts of, of, uh, and components. And the third one is intermediates. And so here in the bottom part, this is magnified so you can see more clearly what's going on. Many people take trade in intermediate products, so not, not finished products, intermediate products, as a proxy of global value chains and the proxy for fragmentation. So if you look at what happens here, in 2013, trade in intermediates starts going down. So this is the trend that has induced many to say that we have a change in trend, a technologically driven change in trend. Uh, however, if you look at what happens in parts and components, that's the red line, this is not the case. So you see no change in trend. What, what drives the difference? It turns out uh, trading intermediates depends to a very large extent on commodity prices. Um, so it's, it's not a story about technology, it's a, it's a story about commodity prices. On the other hand, measures of uh, parts and components are less subject to this, to this point. Um, and uh, trading parts and components actually shows an increase in the last year. So if you take this evidence, nothing is conclusive because as I said, we have only very few years. Uh, the, the, there is no strong evidence that we have a, a, a change in the scope of fragmentation. What does this imply? Uh, oh, just to finish, a, a different story about why we see this decline in the importance of global value chain is the role of China. And just briefly, China has been rebalancing it tries to increase its domestic value. Um, it's emphasizing domestic consumption. You can see that clearly here. This is the domestic value in China, uh, and it has been increasing steadily after the financial crisis. By the way, the only other country that exhibits this pattern is Korea. Right? And again, China is big. It, it commands a very large share of international trade. So the presence of China, the fact that chi China is rebalancing towards its domestic economy affects the aggregate statistics. But my point is that we don't have any strong, strong evidence that there is a technologically driven uh, change in trend in globalization. What this means, so if you believe that policy did play a role in fueling globalization, and if you believe that it's not technology, that technology alone that drives the slowdown, this means that policy in principle can also reverse the, the globalization that we experienced in the last few years. That contrary to the common belief, globalization is not unstoppable and it's not inevitable. And so that brings me to the current policy environment, which is one characterized by a backlash against globalization. Uh, and there are a few, a few points that I want to make here. The first one is that in many advanced economies, we are experiencing a revolt um, against globalization. And by globalization here, I mean both trade and immigration. In some countries, it's more about trade, like in the United States. In other countries, uh, mostly Europe, it's, more, it's, it's, name, it's, it's mostly about immigration. Uh, this is not specific to a particular country. Uh, this is not specific to a particular administration. Uh, it's not specific to a particular person. And it's not specific to um, a particular uh, mindset or set of beliefs. Uh, we see that, uh, we see this um, backlash both among liberals and among conservatives. In the United States, there is often bipartisan support against free trade. Um, so, so I think there is a change, uh, a, a change in the public sentiment here. In addition to that, and that's perhaps more important, 
Uh, the World Trade Organization has become paralyzed. It, fa it faces an existential crisis. Those of you who know the particulars of trade policy will know that this has a lot to do with the way the appellate court works. Uh, I don't have the time to, to get into the details. Uh, in addition, uh, there have been some long-standing concerns about how the trading system has worked so far, and despite this rosy picture that they have painted so far, namely one where tariffs have come down and, and uh, the World Trade Organization has um, become more inclusive uh, of developing countries and there are many regional, regional trade agreements, there has also been very uneven liberalization uh, across different areas of trade. Importantly, agricultural trade has not been liberalized. This is a long-standing complaint of many developing countries that they cannot participate because they don't have access to agricultural markets. Uh, there is a very limited opening of services trade, and we hear this complaint a lot from businesses, from big firms that often cannot offer the services across the border because of um, of different regulations, uh, different license requirements, even among integrated parts of the world, such as the European Union. And last but not least, uh, there are many concerns about what is called these days behind the border measures and other distortions. So what are these measures? So there are many complaints about stained on enterprises and, they, and how they affect competition. There are concerns about intellectual property, about forced technology transfer, and, and, and so on. Okay. And uh, uh, all, these, all these concerns point to a certain dissatisfaction with the way the trading system has worked. Um, as a result, we find ourselves in a new policy environment, so namely one where tariffs have increased. So these are the tariffs as of 2018, the new tariff increases, so approximately 12% of US imports have been affected by tariffs, approximately 6% of Chinese exports, the percentage in Mexico and the EU is lower. These are not large percentages, but they show a reversal in trend. More importantly, perhaps, if you ask how many new regional trade agreements have been signed, the number is very small in 2018, and to a certain extent, this reflects uh, the increase in uncertainty about the future of trade, um, and also this, this uh, concern about the, the uh, workings of the trading system that I pointed out before. What are the effects of all this changing environment to date? So in a recent paper, we look at the effects of the rising trade, trade tensions on the US. And so far, so far, the effects, the aggregate effects, according to our estimates, have been really minuscule. We don't see big effects on the economy. We do see distributional effects, and namely, we do find that the US, the consumers, the buyer side, bears the entire cost of tariffs. We also find that the agricultural regions of the US were adversely affected. So in the short run, the aggregate effects don't seem to be very large. However, we do... Uh, we do, there is talk of increased uncertainty, all measures, there are various measures of uncertainty, and all these measures show that uncertainty has increased. And the important concern is that we could have long-run effects on investment uh, that could lead to global value chain relocation, and these effects could be very, very large in the long run. So in the short run, we don't see any, any dramatic effects, but the uncertainty about the long run has increased. So against this, uh, this background, the, the question that arises is, how should we be thinking about these new developments? Uh, is this just a small blip in the, in the long-term trend of globalization? So is this just a short break the world is taking? Or, or, or are we really at the beginning of, uh, of a new era of sustained deglobalization? And the answer, I think, is going is one that is going to depend very much on the policy changes, uh, on the policy choices that are made in the next few years. Uh, uh, before I get to these policy choices, I think the first step is to, to try to think about what caused this backlash in the first place. So why do we see this reversal in trends? Why do we see this uh, backlash against globalization? And if we understand these causes, maybe we can also come up with possible uh, solutions uh, to address the issue. 
So what are the causes of this backlash? So let me start with uh, noting a, a sort of puzzle. The backlash started, I, I would claim, at a time of global prosperity. So unemployment is at a 50-year low in the US. The stock market is strong. Uh, so why is this happening now? Uh, one way to try to answer this question is to look at um, surveys that try to measure public attitudes and the PW Research uh, Center uh, provides such uh, surveys. Let me show you a few pictures. So the first picture shows the attitudes towards free trade as of 2002. And so let me note what the scale of the, of the vertical axis is. Uh, this is 1990. So this says that 90% of the, of the respondents indicate that trade and business ties are good for the economy. So if you look at what the responses are across different countries, or in general, the responses show an attitude that's very favorable towards free trade, and that applies even to the US. It's, it's very pronounced in some developing countries in East Asia, importantly, Vietnam and China, as you might expect. Let me show you the same picture for 2014 now. Two things to note. First, there is much more dispersion across countries. So there is no uniform uh, assessment, no, no, no uniform euphoria towards free trade. The US is lower than it used to be. So this shows the general sentiment towards free trade that's more, that's more uh, reserved. But nevertheless, I will claim, look at the scale here. Still, the, the, the large majority of the population still think free trade is beneficial to the economy. Now, if you ask them about specific, uh, specific views on the effects of trade on the labor market, then you get a very different picture. And namely here, the question was, uh, uh, trade, uh, does trade lower wages? Here, the question is, does trade destroy jobs? And what you see is that in the US, approximately 50% of the population think that trade lowers wages and that trade destroys jobs. Uh, if you ask the reverse question, does trade raise wages? Does trade create jobs? Uh, you see exactly the opposite. You know, there, are very, there is a very low percentage of people who think that uh, trade is actually good for workers. And what's also interesting in this graph is the slope of this line. So here you see the developing countries, uh, Vietnam, China, India, Mexico, Brazil. So uh, in these countries, there is a relatively small percentage of people who think that, um, that trade is not good for workers. The majority of people here in Vietnam, in China, in Brazil, in Mexico, they think trade is, is good for workers. Okay, so the attitudes are very different. So while the global attitudes on, on the benefits, on the aggregate benefits of free trade uh, are positive when it comes to the effects on workers, on wages, and on employment, the effects tend to be very different between developing and developed countries. So this you know, obviously points to, to uh, an important uh, cause for the uh, changing sentiment uh, towards trade, namely the unequal effects of globalization. And these effects are unequal both across countries, but also within countries. So uh, before I go on, let me make a short, let me make a very brief point on, on, on the gains from trade, on the aggregate gains from trade. Uh, as trade economists, as economists in general, we always emphasize that trade is good for an economy. It's good for all economies. All economies specialize from specialization. That said, what recent work has showed is that in static models, so if we ignore dynamic effects, if we just focus on the short run, then the effects of trade on aggregate welfare tend to be very small. And what, so there is, for those of you familiar with the academic literature, this comes from uh, what we call the ACR formula. But intuitively, the, the explanation for that is as follows. When you have a very large country, let's say the US, uh, this economy does not rely on trade as much as a small country. So if you depart from free trade, yes, uh, the economy is not as efficient, but it can still function pretty well. So there is an aggregate loss, but this loss is not very large. On the other hand, if you have a very small economy and you depart from free trade, then the effects can be catastrophic. 
But when we apply this kind of thinking to countries like the United States or the UK, these are large economies, yes, the short-run effects are negative. They are not positive, but they're not huge. They're not catastrophic. And this is something to keep in mind, that when we look at departure from free trade or the current trade tensions and people expect to see a disaster, you are not going to see the disaster in the short run. It, doesn't, it wouldn't make sense. Yes, the, the economies would not be as efficient, but you wouldn't see uh, a huge effect simply because these economies can rely on their own resources, they are large. Okay? And this is very much consistent with what we find uh, in this work on the United States, we don't see catastrophic effects in the United States because of the trade war. However, the distributional effects can be considerable in the short run. And ultimately, trade is all about distribution. In the long run, I will argue, it's also very much about efficiency and innovation. So the, the long run effects of trade protection can be disastrous. But you're not going to see these disastrous effects in the short run. Then you're looking in the wrong place to see them. What you do see in the, in the short run, what you, you do see in the short and medium run are the distributional effects, not the aggregate effects. Okay. So uh, let me uh, now you know, focus on, 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 on this question of how globalization affects inequality. And that raises immediately the question, what do we mean by inequality? So um, as uh, uh, Paul pointed out, uh, the, the subtitle of the Deaton Review is Inequalities in the 21st Century. And I, I've always said I, I love the fact that I love the plural in this title because it makes absolutely clear that inequality has many different aspects. And this applies even to the issue of uh, uh, how globalization affected inequality. Um, what kind of inequality are we talking about? So let me try to put some structure into this question by making the following distinctions. First, between global inequality and within country inequality, and then uh, within the category of within country inequality, I will distinguish about how consumers, how people are affected as consumers versus how people are affected as workers. Okay, so by global inequality, we mean how inequality at the global scale has been affected, how the distance between the average citizen in the US and the average citizen <coughs> in Somalia or in Vietnam has changed. And there is considerable evidence coming from many sources that this global inequality has been reduced dramatically post World War II. Um, I, would, I, I consider that one of the greatest achievements of our time. Uh, what are the sources? So Deaton's book, The Great Escape, comes to mind where he makes exactly this point, both about trade and immigration. Um, the World Bank's uh, World Development Report in 2006 made this point. Uh, more recently, Brango Milanovic's uh, book on global inequality again made this point. And uh, even though this is a question that, um, that does not lend itself to careful econometric studies and, and clean identification, uh, there is no question that globalization has played an important role in reducing this poverty. So this comes from cumulative evidence on the integration of China and East Asian countries. Many country studies, including those conducted by my predecessor at, at, at the World Bank, Ann Kruger, who um, reviewed evidence from many developing countries as they were entering the world trading system. So if you take all this evidence uh, cumulatively, uh, it suggests that the, 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 the integration of developing countries into the world trading system played an important role in reducing uh, global poverty. And that in turn raises the question of whether we are not faced these days with an important trade-off between global inequality and within country inequality. And I think this is, this is a question that all of us have to face. Uh, if you're a politician in an advanced economy, uh, it's very easy to forget about global inequality. You represent the interest of your constituency. But as, a, as, a, as, as an academic or as a, as a public intellectual or as, as someone who works at the World Bank, this is a question that is important. How do we value um, a citizen in, in, uh, in a poor country, in a poor developing country, um, relative to a, to a citizen in our own country. Um, so, uh, very briefly, these are, these are the, the, the graphs suggesting the, the decrease in global inequality. I will go through them very fast. This is the, the famous elephant curve. So, the, the, the blue line was drawn by... You know, my current colleague, Caroline Freund, 
to show the elephant, but um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the, the, the green line was thrown by her. The blue line, this is what people call the growth incidence curve. So on the horizontal axis, you have the population, the global population of the whole world is split into different percentiles. And on the, on the vertical axis, you see the income growth rate, the per capita growth, uh, income growth rate for the average citizen in the world. And what this graph shows, and it's quite striking, is you see substantial growth for those at the lower, at the left tail of the income distribution. So, so this suggests, you also see a very sharp increase for the top 1%. But what this implies is essentially that, that you had a huge um, decrease in global inequality and global poverty. So this is, uh, these are data based on surveys and the well-known problem with survey data is they miss the very rich because the very rich do not report their income and even when they do report it, it's very often top coded. So more recently, uh, various researchers reproduced this graph using uh, administrative data uh, on income tax records and also for a different period up to 2016. And then this, this curve looks a bit different, doesn't look like an elephant anymore. And very, very strikingly, you see the huge increase in the share captured by the top 1%. This is something that has been documented for many different countries. You see this, you know, this particular increase here, but I would argue, let's not forget that you still see this part here. So you see that for the lower uh, percentiles, you still see that they capture 50, the bottom 50% capture about 12% of total growth. So the, the, the people who are hurt here are the middle class. Uh, however, the poor still, and these are these, uh, you know, this part of the distribution here reflects the developing countries or the emerging countries, these countries still do fairly well. And so the result of all this is this graph that comes from World Bank publications. So this shows global, this is those total poverty, extreme poverty. So based on the $1.9 per day measure. And this poverty was very high, 1990 as you, as you see. By 2030, it's projected to have been eliminated in almost the entire world, except that's the yellow part, that's Africa. So if, you, if, we, if we leave out Africa for a moment, so this is Sub-Saharan Africa, and I don't know if you can see it, this purple part here is uh, North Africa in the Middle East. So if you took these parts out for the rest of the world, poverty is projected to be eliminated by 2030. Um, Africa is a different story. Um, but, but the point I want to make is that we, we, we do see a positive, uh, trend uh, post-World War II, and this is that uh, at a global <laughs> scale, poverty has been reduced dramatically. Um, poverty and global inequality. So that leads you know, to, to, the following, uh, to the following hypothesis. To a certain extent, I believe that the backlash <laughs> we're experiencing reflects um, a view that that uh, the reduction of poverty, the, redu the reduction of global inequality is happening at the expense of advanced economies. Uh, we hear very frequent complaints that large developing countries abuse some provisions of the world trading system, for example, the special and differential um, uh, treatment status. Uh, there are many complaints that market access uh, in some developing countries is very limited. I already mentioned subsidies, state-owned enterprise, intellectual property rights, forced technology transfers. Uh, service trade is still very limited. The rise of behind the border transactions and various regulations that make it very hard to trade. Um, all this is compounded by the fact that, that uh, all of these factors are very hard to measure. We hear complaints, we, 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 we read reports in the newspapers. It's hard to tell what's real and what's really an excuse, what, ref what reflects simply um, a certain negative, state, uh, a negative sentiment towards developing countries. Uh, one would think that better data would make measurement uh, easier, that we could actually get some scientifically grounded measures uh, that would tell us how important all these complaints are, but despite better data, despite the fact that we have more data, 
in many cases, it's very hard to measure this behind the border restrictions or these regulatory restrictions. And so, uh, to sum up, I think this, all this has contributed to uh, a rising sentiment against developing countries. Um, and this is, in my view, uh, an alarming trend. Uh, let me come to the, sec to, to the uh, second type of, type of inequality, namely within country inequality, and start with people as workers. So that brings us to the labor market effects of globalization, and there is a lot that has been written about that. Um, some observations, uh, during the 70s and 80s and 90s, people documented an increase in the skill premiums, so the compensation of skilled workers in the US and Europe. Uh, polarization starting in the late 90s, so this means this is the depression of wages and employment for mid-level jobs. Uh, most importantly, the decline in manufacturing, which is pronounced in all European countries. Uh, if you look at the UK, the UK is the dotted line here. For the UK, it's steeper than any other country. Uh, there is a regional dimension to this decline in manufacturing unemployment, so uh, as you can tell, so this is the blue bar, is manufacturing employment in the UK in 1975, and the red is in 2015. You see that in all regions there is a decline, but in some regions it's more pronounced than others. Okay, and so what does all this have to do with globalization, all these uh, trends in the labor market? So what do we know so far? One natural way to think about these issues is to apply the workhorse model of international trade, that's the Hexerolin model, to understanding these issues. And because the, the Hexerolin model is a very natural way to link product markets, to, to link what happens in product markets through trade to what happens to wages uh, and the return to capital. If you do that, the consensus in the literature, and this is one of the rare cases where economists agree and not uh, even within a field, but even trade and labor economists, across economists across many different fields, agreed in the end that trade played only a very small role in the rise of the skill premium. And to the extent that it did play a role, it played only a secondary role in interaction with technology. That was the consensus until fairly recently, until the 2000s. And then the consensus started shifting in the 2000s, and trade emerged again. Uh, as, as a culprit, as a, potential, as a potential suspect, as a potential driver for the rising um, uh, inequality in labor markets. And the question is why? Why do we think that trade has become more important in 2000 or two, in, in the last two decades? Uh, there are two explanations. Uh, one is that it's all because of China, and you hear that very often. Um, I noticed that one of the, of the people who gave the IFS annual lecture a few years ago was David Otto, who has worked a lot on this topic, and you know, David would claim it's all the China shock. Uh, another possibility, and that's, that's my view, is that it also has a lot to do that we focus these days on a different dimension of inequality, namely instead of focusing on the skill premium, so the compensation of the highly educated workers, now we focus on a different dimension, namely the special dimension, the regional dimension of inequality. And let me tell you, let, let me briefly explain what I mean. So there are various papers that focus on the China, the so-called China shock. And they show that China was responsible for a very dramatic decline in US manufacturing employment. So this is a picture that comes from a paper by Pierce and Schott in the American Economic Review. And so this is manufacturing employment in the US over the years, starting in 1948. You see these shaded areas. These shaded areas denote recession. So every time you have a recession, employment goes down, but then it bounces back, right? You see that all the time. Then we come, we reach here, year 2001. There is a recession, that's the blue part here. And then employment goes down, and then it never bounces back. So what happens then, that's when China hits. And so Pierce and Schott say what happened then in around 2001 is there was a policy change in the United States. That brings me again back to my point that policy here is important. Uh, the policy change in the United States was that China was granted permanent trade relations. And then immediately it was followed by China's accession to the World Trade Organization. 
So what many have claimed is the timing was particularly important here because the US was coming out of a recession. And that's, again, that's exactly when Chinese imports hit the country. Under normal circumstances, uh, the country would have bounced back from the recession. Employment would have bounced back from the recessions. If we had not had a recession, then the country would have managed to absorb the Chinese imports. But the interaction of the two, so the fact that, that the Chinese imports hit exactly as the US was coming out of a recession, made it so there was a dramatic decrease in manufacturing employment. So this is, this is uh, one view. Um, the, the alternative interpretation, that, so, so this view raises some questions. And one question is why this story applies to the US. Uh, we haven't seen the same dramatic increases, uh, the same dramatic effects of the Chinese import competition in other countries. We have not seen them in, in Europe, and we have not seen them in developing countries, and many developing countries were exposed to the same degree of competition from China. So, uh, yes, China is very large, and yes, China has expanded its exports, but I think this is only a partial explanation of why we've seen such big effects on the U.S. labor market. Another explanation, in my view, is, as I mentioned earlier, that we have focused on a different dimension, uh, namely this spatial dimension, this regional dimension. Um, so the paper that I mentioned by David Otto, that's the paper he talked about when he presented here, actually exploited how different communities, different commuting zones within the United States had been differentially affected by Chinese import competition. And so the point they make, David and his co-authors, is that, <clears throat> that uh, uh, the Chinese import competition affected some communities more than others. It was all a point about relative uh, effects, about inequality, regional inequality. This point has been made uh, in many different contexts, including many developing countries. So there is work by Petya Topalova on India, Dix Carneiro and Kovac on Brazil. More recently, there is work on Vietnam. That makes exactly the same point, that when you have a trade shock hitting a country, and that can be a positive shock. For example, in Vietnam, exports increased. The effects tend to be very uneven regionally. Uh, some regions are affected more than others. The same applies to India, the same applies to Brazil. And so what we see in many cases is regionals in, regional inequalities uh, changing. What it suggests is that there is, there is limited mobility across space. So in textbook models of economics, we always model people as moving very fast in space. That if a region is, is hit by a negative shock, it may have some adjustment costs, but eventually people pack and go somewhere else. That's, that's the premise. All this work suggests that this is not the case. And let me show you some graphs that, again, tell the story. This is from a paper on Brazil. And Brazil was exposed to a big trade liberalization uh, in the early 90s. So all the liberalization happened here. What this paper shows is what happens uh, to employment in the formal sector. Okay. Um, so before the liberalization, the employment was fairly steady. Then liberalization hits. Okay, this is from the perspective of the domestic economy. This is a negative demand shock. So employment goes down. So, and then employment in the long run, in subsequent year, keeps going down. So what's surprising about this is that you would always have thought that when a particular uh, region is affected by a negative demand shock in the short run, there are negative effects on employment. But we all have thought that in the short run, employment goes down and then it bounces back. Why would it bounce back? Because people move. Wages go down, that attracts new workers to the place. Or people leave and they go to the areas that have uh, more employment. Uh, we don't see that here. So in Brazil, what you see is a prolonged decline in employment, by the way, these are all relative effects. So these are effects across regions. If you looked at earnings, so uh, uh, earnings in the formal sector in Brazil, again, same story, in fact, even more dramatic because earnings in the formal sector were increasing prior to the liberalization. When liberalization hits, the regions that are affected more by liberalization experience a hit 
in earnings, and then earnings keep going down and down and down. And you know, eventually this stabilizes, but if you actually look, it takes about 20 years for the economy to stabilize, and it stabilizes at a much lower level. So this is a pretty bleak story in some sense, because it suggests that the adjustment costs are huge, and it takes a very long time for, um, for regions to adjust. Uh, the, the effects are not confined to employment and earnings. Uh, so all this work that I mentioned shows that there are also similar effects on, other, on many other outcomes, on child labor, on education, on crime. So then the community as a whole is affected. And so that raises many questions, one of which is why is the inter-region mobility so low? Um, what's the nature of mobility costs? And how long is the long run? And why we don't have the answers and we need much more research to, to answer these questions, I will make two observations. One is that all this work suggests that the long run could be very long. So for example, the work of, of Otter and Toll on the China shock looks at over a decade of data. So it's at least a decade or more. Uh, the work I just showed you on Brazil looks over the period of 20 years. And, and it finds that it takes two decades for these regional effects to eventually stabilize. So, so the long run can be very long. And this is actually a new insight that recent research has produced. We would not have thought that, that the adjustment period is so long. Um, just very briefly, there are additional results in all this work. For example, it shows that eventually when the economy in Brazil stabilizes, it's because of the role that the informal sector Place. And that, again, raises additional questions. What's the importance of labor market frictions? What are the welfare and policy implications of having large informal sectors in many developing countries? So, so far I talked about inequality uh, related to uh, people in countries um, for, as, as, as workers. So from a labor market point of view, but people are not only the participant in the economy, not only as workers, but also as consumers. And one of the important insights of trade, trade theory is that trade benefits consumers, that trade leads to lower prices, higher quality, more variety. So that's what theory tells us. So what about the data? Uh, so empirical work on prices on the consumer side of this equation tends to be limited. Uh, partly because these effects are, are very hard to measure. <coughs> in some work I've done with India with various co-authors, we found that a lot of, that there is evidence that these effects are real. So the trade liberalization in India reduced prices, it increased quality, it led to greater product variety, but at the same time it increased firm profits. Uh, so it did benefit consumers in the form of lower prices, but this price declines were smaller than we would have thought and definitely smaller than predicted by models of, of perfect competition. And, and so what's the reason for that? So the reason for that intuitively is the following. The liberalization in, in the case of India reduced tariffs on inputs, on products that India imported in order to produce domestically. So what these cost reductions, uh, what these tariff reductions did is they reduce the cost of producers. But these cost reductions were not passed through to consumers in the form of lower prices. So essentially what happened is the cost declined, the prices declined, by, but by not as much as the costs. As a result, the profit margins increased. So we do get these beneficial effects on consumers, but the picture is more nuanced because at the same time, firm profits, markups as we call them, increase as well. Okay, and this is the, the picture that goes um, along with this story. So these are profits in India, variable profits in India. So this is when the liberalization happens, they increase after that time. It turns out this is a story that applies not only to India. This is a, a, a by now famous graph coming from a paper by the Locker and Eckhout. They documented um, what happened to profits average firm profits, variable profits, so these don't take into account capital costs or the cost of intangibles, as we say. But they document that in the US, starting in 1980, profits started going up dramatically. Uh, 
they replicated this figure for almost every country in the world. And you see the same trend in Europe, in North America, in Asia, in Oceania. You don't see it in South America or Africa. And it's interesting why not. Okay. So one question is, given what we found in India, to what extent can you make the general, can you link this increase in profits uh, to this increase in globalization, to, this, uh, to trade liberalization? Um, did it contribute to the so-called decline in labor shares, to the fact that we see worldwide the capital share increasing at the expense of labor? So let me show you some graphs that come from some recent work we did at the World Bank on uh, global value chains, actually. So this is for one particular industry. This is textiles. And textiles is a highly integrated industry worldwide. It's dominated by global value chains. And what we did in this graph is for many different countries, um, we show the correlation between average markup, so that's the red line, and participation in global value chains. And so some of the countries here are Belgium, uh, Germany, France, the UK, uh, Japan, and the United States. And in all of these countries, these are all advanced economies. This is all textiles. You see that the more integrated uh, uh, the, the, the sector becomes over time, the higher the markups. So what's the story here intuitively? So these global value chain firms, these global value chain industries, search for lowest cost locations. So search for, try to spread their production, uh, located in countries where the costs are minimized. So what this does is it makes their costs, it depresses their costs. If these cost reductions are not passed through to consumers in the form of lower prices, this increases the profit margins. So this is the channel through which globalization may actually increase profit margins. This is not, uh, this is a story that tends to show how globalization benefits advanced economies that benefit from this outsourcing of uh, production activities to low wage countries. Looking at textile again, at textiles again, we don't find this correlation for India, for example, for developing countries. And just to be clear that this is not the full story about the declining labor share, this is how these graphs look for a different sector, transport equipment. So for transport equipment, you don't see this positive correlation. So it's not the case that globalization is the, the only reason for this declining labor share that I talked about. But I think it's one of the, of the, of the drivers. There is additional evidence on prices and effects on consumers that comes primarily from studies on developing countries. Um, so there is uh, a study showing that retail globalization in Mexico actually benefited consumers, but it benefited mostly consumers um, at, the, at, at the right tail of the distribution. Intuitively, why is this the case? Because many of these big retail chains, take Walmart, for example, uh, locate outside cities. You, you need a car to access them, and many poor households don't even have a car to, to go and shop there. Uh, there is another study of uh, Haravel and Sager for the United States, a very recent one, that uh, uh, shows that the trade with China led to uh, lower prices in the U.S., and that these lower prices in the U.S. benefited substantially, uh, that, that benefited primarily low-income consumers. Um, so again, if you just look at um, the effects on consumers, the effects may be very different across different countries. The, the, the price effects tend to benefit rich consumers in Mexico, but they benefit low consumers in the United States. So let me, uh, I'm out of time, so let me uh, just sum up what uh, I've shown so far and also conclude with some policy implications. Uh, there is strong evidence that the effects of globalization have been uneven, and when we say uneven, um, uneven across many different dimensions, they've been uneven across countries, They've been uneven across regions within countries, and uh, that's where all the action is these days. Uh, they've been um, uneven across formal and informal workers within developing countries. They've been uneven across producers and consumers, and there is a lot of evidence that in many countries, um, globalization has benefited producers more than consumers. 
the statement that globalization has increased inequality is not justified in my view. You, if, you, if you look across the various cases I showed you and across, across all the, the evidence, there are many cases where actually globalization reduced inequality and there are many other cases where globalization increased inequality and it really matters on what dimension of inequality uh, you focus on. However, the, I started by motivating this whole question by the current backlash we experience. And the current backlash is, in my view, very closely tied to, um, to regional inequality, to the special, to the special dimension of inequality. Uh, the effects of trade tend, tends to be locally concentrated, and this has very important uh, policy implications. And uh, the one thing that's for sure is that no matter what the effects are on inequality, Globalization does cause disruption. So what are the policy implications in the end? Um, one important one is that, that we need to focus much more on disruption and on the transition rather than on steady states. So we, in textbook models of international trade, but very often also in the, in the policy debate, we tend to focus on what will eventually happen and we forget that there is a transition path in between. And often the backlash we experience has very much to do with the transition, not with the end. Uh, result. Uh, the recent findings, especially on regional inequality, provide the potential justification of what we call place-based policies. And these place-based policies are often have a, a, a very, uh, uh, economists often have a very negative view on these place-based policies. They are considered to be distortionary. Uh, this, these findings on the role of, uh, on the importance of special inequality uh, raise the question whether we shouldn't, we shouldn't be rethinking uh, uh, the, the justification of such policies. Rising firm profits, global value chains, the, the emergence of global uh, platforms raise important questions about how these global firms are to be treated. And uh, importantly, they raise many questions about taxations and how do we, how do we tax these firms that are, that are footloose and mobile across space. And finally, um, international cooperation in trade, but also in many other areas, other than trade, is needed more than ever. Uh, partly because, as I showed you there, it, trade is fueled and the trade tensions uh, uh, are due not just to what happens to narrowly defined measures of trade, such as tariffs or quotas or measures that we have a good uh, handle of measuring, but also measures, these behind the border measures, regulations, and other aspects of economic activity that are much harder to measure. And international cooperation in these areas is quite important. So I will stop here, and I'm sorry I ran a little late, but I'll be very happy to take questions. Well, uh, thank you so much for that, Penny. That was a fantastic uh, tour de force and uh, tour de raison and many other tours. Um, it was absolutely great. Um, uh, I'm, 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 I just wanted to make two comments, uh, which I think are particularly pertinent to the um, situation here today. The first, you very strongly made the point that policy matters here, and it matters in the long run. And, um, and, and our politicians need to be, I think, rather more aware of that than... Uh, than, than, than they often are. Um, and the second is, is the very last point you made, which is that trade policy and free trade agreements and tariffs really matter. But international cooperation, among many other things, uh, to make those work um, also, uh, also matters, which is uh, quite relevant in the context of withdrawing from um, all of those uh, in the EU. Um, I imagine there's a number of questions. I think we should take... We've got... Uh, 15 minutes or so, um, I think we should take a few um, at a time. Let's start right down in the corner here. Mohammed Amin, I'm of course very conscious about the policy issues at the moment between the United States and China, but I, as I was listening to you, I was thinking about another factor that potentially in the long run reduces the share of exports in an economy like China's or India's as the economy grows because as Chinese become richer, they will be consuming more 
services which are consumed domestically and potentially consuming more of their own manufactured outputs. And can you see any of that effect in the figures themselves in terms of China's exports as a proportion of GDP? Okay, and then there's a, a lady here. Thank you, uh, Sheila Page, ODI. On policy, you seem to treat it as being, in a sense, a rational response. I mean, maybe not a response an economist would consider rational to events. But how, a lot of what you point out is response to needing someone to blame, whether it's for the slow rise in uh, uh, median incomes in the US recently, or uh, austerity in the UK, or even some of the disruptions in China. And it's not unusual for the obvious person to blame to be the foreigner. We're seeing it in South Africa and Nigeria at the moment. Isn't it just that globalization has made the foreigner a little bit more conspicuous and therefore a rather better target? Question, and, and here. Yeah, just pass it across. Yeah. Oh, okay. um, uh, Steve Shearson City University, just looking at sort of the more historical political economy of this issue, trade. Clearly, f up until recently, it was the trade liberalization was driven completely by the US, US policy in the sense that they were the initiator of the World Trade Organization negotiations, and they were the ones essentially made the main concessions because they wanted a, a world trade uh, framework. They're willing to allow some developing countries to come, and even if it might hurt some aspects of the US. And, it seems to me what's changed, and this is what was reflected in the Doha negotiations, that the U.S. is no longer prepared to play that role as a hegemon to get trade, uh, get trade liberalized any further. So the question really is, is there any other country or region that can take that role? For example, either the EU or China, or are we stuck in now uh, where there's no one who's prepared to actually make the concessions that would oil the, the, the way to liberalize trade? So three pretty big questions there. One about um, you know, what happens as, as China grows. One about, uh, you know, is any of this rational? Is it, is it just that foreigners are more conspicuous and easy to blame? And then who's going to replace the U.S. in oiling the, the wheels of international trade? Um, so, so let me start with the first one that's perhaps easiest to answer because we definitely see exactly the trend you described. So we do see the Chinese economy rebalancing. So one of the figures I showed you is the domestic value increasing in China. And this reflects exactly what you described, that now that um, the Chinese economy is growing, they're refocusing the economic activity towards their own domestic market. But that raises a, a number of other issues, given how large this market is. There are many countries who want a share of it. And so it's more important than ever for this market to be open. So one of the contentious issues is to what extent is this market, this market open for imports from other countries. Um, the question about blaming foreigners, I mean, you are absolutely right that <coughs> foreigners are an easy target, but this doesn't necessarily mean that uh, the claim is not justified. So the question is, is that just an excuse or are the effects real? And what I try to, so, so the claim that um, uh, foreign competition or imports are to blame for everything bad that happens in labor markets in the US or the UK is not new. It started in the 90s when the skill premium was increasing and economists look into this issue and then the conclusion was the claim was not justified. So in that case, I would fully agree with you that um, the foreigners, the foreign countries were the scapegoats, but the evidence did not support these claims. <clears throat> when we look at the evidence now, there is actually evidence that foreign competition has played a role, but again, only the special dimension. So when it comes to the regional effects of trade, there is a lot of evidence that it, it has something to do uh, with foreign competition. Now, the, the implication of this, the policy implication, is not that we close off our markets. The obvious implication is that we try to address these regional disparities. Um, regarding the political economy, um, 
I mean, I think it's fair to say that to a certain extent the WTO has become the victim of its own success. Uh, it it <clears throat> broadened its scope. It has now many more members than at the beginning. But the result of this was the members became very heterogeneous. They have, uh, they, they, they pursue many different objectives. It's hard to have agreement on any issue. Um, there have been many, uh, many efforts to reform the system. Uh, some very good efforts in my opinion. The question is whether it's not too late. One of the proposals is to let's try to do it without the United States. So, you know, the appellate uh, court that's currently uh, paralyzed, you know, presenting the WTO in an existential crisis, in principle could still work if you took the US out. But I think the consensus is that without the US it would not be the same because it's a very large economy. So without the US, uh, the, all these, all these organizations would have much less, uh, much less bite. Great. Uh, next, uh, next round. So, uh, lady, right at the front <coughs> here, and then I'll go towards the back. <coughs> I can see. Okay, um, Bharti Keshwara. Um, so, in light of um, the inequalities that you highlighted, um, has the World Bank uh, enhanced any of its methods? Um, in terms of policy methods, in terms of trying to factor in any of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and also going forward, what's your opinion on sort of the World Bank's policy shift away from like the Washington consensus top-down approach of um, TNCs doing FDI and structural loans towards a more bottom-up approach, perhaps towards the Wall Street consensus, um, whereby, you know, developing countries' poorer population is given skills and capital to, you know, uh, develop themselves, uh, whether that's through entrepreneurship or other means. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, <coughs> guy in the middle of the <coughs> row there. Oh, okay. um, uh, thank you for an extraordinarily insightful presentation. You mentioned companies towards the end of your talk. And I think that if you look at international trade, it seems to be that companies are the common vector for inequality for a number of reasons. Capital is notoriously more mobile than labor. In terms of the way in which companies distribute the pr increased margins that you were referring to, that goes to the shareholders rather than the employees for the reasons you were mentioning. And corporate governance, unlike democratic governance, has not evolved over the last 150, 200 years. And it's still run on the basis of one pound, one vote, or the equivalent currency. So companies are run by, on the purest form of plutocracy ever devised by mankind. As a consequence of this, you would expect them to vote for the money and as companies become more important compared to countries, uh, you would expect them to exercise their power and therefore aggregate the money to the shareholders. I was wondering in terms of your own research whether there are indications of how corporates act in the international sphere rather than looking at countries themselves. Is there a different way in which you can analyze the figures you've been giving us this evening? Thank you. And now there's a, there's a guy sitting um, in the middle <coughs> here. I don't know if someone could take a microphone to him or if you could pass it back, maybe. You can come and get it. <laughs> get it there somehow. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you. My name is David Whittaker. I was struck by those charts that showed the correlation between GDP and attitudes towards trade. And I just wondered, can we dig a bit deeper into those charts to see if it's low-income groups within the richer countries which are driving the less favorable view on trade? And if so, will they change their attitudes when the distributional impacts of these trade wars start to affect them? Great. Well, let's take those three for now. There's one on the World Bank's approach, sustainable development goals, and so on. One about the role of companies in, in all of this. Mm -hmm. uh, and one about whether it's low-income groups in developed countries who are anti-trade. Um, so so let, me, let me start with the World Bank. Um, as it relates to this particular topic, um, so the World Bank, if you look at the, its main 
goals right now, they are twofold. They're eradicating extreme poverty and shared prosperity. So the, very much the terminology used puts much more weight on inequality, and this was not always the case. Also, there are various agendas, the one, for example, on inclusive growth. Uh, these agendas did not ex ex exist a few years ago. These are agendas that emphasize the fact that equality is considered to be important. Now, what equality exactly means, uh, this is in the eye of the beholder, and that's where there is a lot of room <laughs> for different interpretations. I would say what the World Bank does do right now is when a, a project goes for review, we do ask the question, how is it going to affect not just the aggregate outcomes, but how is it going to affect particular groups of the population? How is it going to affect women? How is it going to affect the poor? How is it going to affect the environment? So the environment doesn't have anything to do with inequality, but my point is that the World Bank does care about measures other than growth. Uh, as far as I know, what has not been done yet is incorporate this measure of regional inequality into the metrics. So this, this spatial measure, this measure of inequality within countries, this has not been incorporated in the metrics yet, as far as I know. Regarding the role of firms, this is, this is a huge question, so I could give another lecture on firms. But, but let me say that one, intellectually, one of the big developments in trade, in academic work, is there was a shift in focus from countries to firms. So in all the work we do, we actually focus on firms as the relevant units of analysis as the decision makers. And there the picture is a little, a bit more mixed. So on one hand, a very strong finding, a very robust finding of all studies is that trade is carried out by big firms. So big firms are more productive, they're more efficient, and they're the ones um, that are engaged in foreign trade. Uh, yes, they do make profits, but when you see it in a small developing country, and a big firm arrives and creates jobs. Uh, this is very welcome uh, for many people there. So uh, you often hear this, um, you often see this view that when, uh, when big multinationals or these big global value chains first arrive in a country and they generate employment, they're, they're very welcome. And not only do they generate employment, they generate good, good employment. Relative to what the domestic economy offers, they offer good jobs. They offer jobs in the formal sector. They have benefits. They employ more women. So this is all, this is the, the good side of the story. Then where the concerns emerge is when these countries start developing. And uh, they try to, to make it from the low income status to the middle income status. And at that point, they don't want their workers to be stuck in low-wage jobs, in low-skilled jobs. They want to go up the value chain. And that's when the tensions with the big firms arise um, because it's often not in their interest to, to share knowledge and, and help workers move up the value chain. Uh, so there the, pic the picture is, is very mixed. Uh, as you pointed out, uh, capital is footloose. <laughs> they can easily move across borders. That makes taxation very, very tough. And that's another area where we need international cooperation because without international cooperation, there is a, a race to the bottom. You know, it's very, uh, it's very easy to try to provide tax incentives to attract capital to your own country, but if everyone does it, in the end, everyone, everyone loses. Um, and so th these are some of the questions that, that uh, we do look at explicitly. Um, and finally, regarding the... Uh, the attitudes towards free trade, um, yes, I mean, the, the, the negative, first of all, <clears throat> when it comes to trade as a whole, to the aggregate effects of trade, uh, there is actually consensus across the whole world that trade is good. That's, that's still the case in advanced economies. Not as pronounced as in developing countries, but, but it's still the consensus in many developed countries is that trade is good. It's only when it comes to the labor market that you see this very big difference in attitudes between advanced economies and developing countries. 
And there it's very much correlated with income, you know, with income level, as you said. So it's the poorer workers in advanced economies who are more worried about trade. Yes. We're pretty much out of time. I know there's quite a number of school students here, so if there's a school student with a question, I'll take that. Um, otherwise, we'll stop. There's one, <coughs> one gentleman standing in the middle here. Um, in terms of the claim about income inequality and how it is uh, you know, unwarranted to make a claim towards that, um, I guess my point would just be on the usage of the elephant graph and the new elephant graph right. in terms of judging that based on income inequality because, of course, it's just relative growth. So if someone who's earning you know, $10 a day, which is around the average, um, gets a 10% increase on that graph, right? it's equal to someone who's earning $200,000 a, uh, a year. Sorry. Um, so you know, if on $200,000, a 10% increase is equal to $20,000, whether well, it's you know, let's say $10 a year, right? That's only an increase of $1 a year. So why not use, if we're trying to have an honest conversation about income inequalities and how, how that changes, why not use something like absolute income difference? Because then you show it's, it's not so much an elephant, but it's a hockey stick. It's, it's quite dramatic, actually. Okay. Interesting question, the difference between um, re relative and absolute differences. Um, that's a good question. I mean. The point I'm trying to make is not whether or not inequality has increased uh, globally. Uh, the point I'm trying to make is that no matter how you measure it, it's very clear that at the very bottom of the distribution, growth was very fast, and that has decreased poverty. So this is not a statement about inequality. It's, uh, it's a statement about poverty. And for poverty, all that matters is the absolute level. So it's the $1.9 per day. So all I'm saying is that the fact that there was so fast growth at the bottom, uh, at the bottom tail, at the bottom end of the distribution means that poverty was, was eliminated. And that's a positive development. Great. Well, um, you're very fortunate having a chair who loves this but, but likes drinks as well. So. Um, <laughs> So, so we, will, we will stop on time. I mean, it just remains for me to say um, this is a fantastic uh, lecture. I learned so much from it, uh, and, and I hope, you know, you did too. The, the, as I say, the importance of policy, the importance of international cooperation, the importance of local and regional uh, interventions uh, at, at, at the top of that, but the complexity of the uh, impact of trade on, on incomes, uh, welfare, and inequality uh, came through all of that. So, so join me once again in thanking Penny. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.